So far, we've talked about chi-square goodness of fit tests and chi-square tests for homogeneity. So this is the third and final chi-square test we have to learn about. This is a chi-square test for independence. So let's talk about independence for a minute and also what it means to have an association. So what does it mean if two variables have an association? In other words, if they're not independent. So we can say that would be a relationship such that one or both distributions influences the other. Remember for chi-square tests, we're talking about distributions of categorical data. So if two variables have an association, that means that they're not independent because they actually influence each other. So what does it mean to be independent then? Well, we can say, uh, in this case, to be independent means you have no association. So there's no association or no influence between the two distributions. So this chi-squared test for independence is actually pretty similar to the test for homogeneity, but we do have to figure out what the differences are and how to tell what those differences are. So the question is, if we have a chi-squared test for independence or a chi-squared test for homogeneity, and this is an important distinction. Both of these two-way tables, they're not like the goodness of fit test. That was the section 11.1, .1. it was just for one-way tables. Uh, so how do we distinguish whether we should do an independence test or a homogeneity test? And actually it all depends on how the data are gathered. So I know we got some experience with actually gathering some data and doing some research in our first semester project. And that's actually what's going to come down to make our decision as far as which of these tests is going to be appropriate to use on our data. Okay, so here's the distinction. In terms of how the data are gathered, if there's only one sample, right, one big sample taken, and we're looking at two different characteristics within that sample, maybe eye color and intelligence, for example, then that means we're testing for an association. We're trying to see if those two characteristics are independent of each other within this one overall sample. So that would be the independence test. For homogeneity, if there are two or more different samples, not just one overall one, if there's two or more different samples and only one characteristic, that's going to be the test for homogeneity. For example, if we do a sample of plain M&Ms, peanut M&Ms, and pretzel M&Ms, right, that's three different samples, and our one characteristic is the distribution of color. Right, we want to see if they all come from the same distribution, right, if they're homogenous. So this is a really important distinction. How to tell if we're doing a test for independence, or you could call it a test for an association, or a chi-square test for homogeneity. Okay, so what are the hypotheses going to look like when we do a chi-square test of independence? Well, we can start with the null. The null is going to say there's no association. Right? There's no association between whatever the two characteristics are for our population. And the alternative would just say the opposite of that. It would say there is an association between those two characteristics for our population. For example, there's no association between eye color and IQ in the population of Lake Park High School West Campus students. And the alternative to that would be somehow there is an association between eye color and IQ in that population of Lake Park High School West Campus students. I know, ridiculous characteristics, but that is an example. Okay, so how about the expected counts if we're doing a test of independence, or the test statistic, or the degrees of freedom? These should actually all be the exact same as what we did for homogeneity. The data come from a two-way table. So for the expected counts, we go to each cell, 
we do the row total times the column total divided by the table total. And that's the exact same as what it was for homogeneity. The test statistic uh, is actually on the formula sheet. It's the same chi-squared test statistic. We take the observed count minus the expected count, square the difference, and divide by the expected count, and we sum all of those values. Lastly, the degrees of freedom from a two-way table. Number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. That's the exact same as it was for the chi-squared test for homogeneity. And actually, you can use the exact same calculator command, that chi-squared test in your calculator. Just be careful to make sure you're defining the name of the test within the problem. So you got to be specific. Are you running a chi-squared test for homogeneity, or are you running a chi-squared test of independence? But when it comes time for the do step, the calculator command is the exact same. It's just chi-squared test. Okay, so what are the conditions? Uh, they're what you might expect. The only thing I'd like to really emphasize here um, that's different than the homogeneity test is that the randomness condition, the data come from one single overall random sample or randomized experiment. For homogeneity, the randomness condition said uh, the two or three or four samples that are taken have to be random. So for the independence test, we just have one single overall random sample. Otherwise, the independence condition is still the same. 10% condition works when you're sampling from a larger population. And then as far as the large counts condition is concerned, we still need to check and make sure that all of our expected counts are at least five. Okay, so the lone example for these notes talks about finger length. It says, is your index finger longer than your ring finger? Does this depend on your gender? A random sample of 460 high school students in the U.S. was selected and asked to record if their pointer finger was longer than, shorter than, or the same length as their ring finger on their left hand. The gender of each student was also reported. The data are summarized in the table below. Okay, so... Looks like there was a total of 227 female respondents, a total of 233 male respondents, and then here's the distribution of finger length among the females and then among the males. So we can say, for example, there were 116 males that had their ring finger as the longer finger. Part A says make a graph to investigate the relationship between gender and relative finger length, and then describe what you see. Okay, so one thing I want to point out here, it would not be fair to start graphing these observed counts. And the reason being is, there was a different total for the female and a different total for the male group. So we should start by just converting these two percentages. So in red, we can do the female percentages, 37% of females, which is 85 over 227, and then 19% of females in this group, 44% of females in this group, and then green here would be the males. Okay, so 73 out of 233 gets us 31% of males, 19%, and then about 50% in this group. And those percentages are all just rounded to two decimal places. So that's only fair because there were a different number of males included in the survey than there were females. All right, so let's go ahead and make a graph here. And on the y-axis, we'll do the proportions. If we go up to 0.6, that looks like it should take care of the highest proportion we see. And on the x-axis, we'll start with a side-by-side -side bar graph here. So let's start with the 0.37 and the 0.31 and that would be the index finger and I'm going to put so I can differentiate here let's make um, some stripes on the bars that represent the males so that's the data for the index finger being longer and then 
as far as the same finger, it looks like we've got 19% for both. So that's same. And then the ring finger, we have 44% versus 50%. And I do need to go ahead and label my axes here. Uh, the x-axis, this was the longer finger that was reported. And the y-axis, that's just the proportion. Lastly, and I almost forgot this, we do need to make a key. Otherwise, we can't differentiate the striped bar versus the not striped bar. So let's add a key in here. The males have the striped bar, and the females have the open bar. So when it says describe what you see, in your statistical opinion, you need to say when were the males higher, when were the females higher, and when were they about the same. And we actually have one of each of those instances here. So we can start by saying uh, the females had a higher proportion for a longer index finger. We can simply just glance at the graph and see that the females bar was higher here. And then for same finger length, they were roughly the same. They're both about 19%. And then lastly, males had a higher proportion where their ring finger was longer. So part B asks, do the data provide convincing evidence at the alpha equals 0.05 level of an association between gender and relative finger length for high school students in the U.S.? Meaning, if you tell me your gender, does that give me information to take a guess as to whether your index finger, ring finger, or maybe they're the same length? Which one's longer? So we start to see somewhat of a difference in the graph here. The question is, is that difference going to be statistically significant? The boring case would be if they were the exact same for each bar. Then there would definitely be no association. They'd be completely independent. You could tell me your gender, and I, I can't tell you whether you're more likely to have a longer ring finger or a longer index finger. But we actually see some sort of difference here. So that makes it a bit more interesting. Maybe there is actually an association. So to find out, we are going to run a significance test. So let's start with the state step. So we want to test two hypotheses, and we're going to use alpha 0.05. We were actually given that. Let's start with the null. So the null hypothesis would say, look, there's no association. There's nothing going on here. There's no association between gender and relative finger length. And we have to be kind of specific about the group we're talking to. It's the U.S. high school students who filled out the survey. That's the overall population. So the null hypothesis would say, look, there's no association. They're completely independent. The alternative hypothesis would just say, yeah, I think there is an association. So I know I kind of save some time and some space just by using the quote marks here. I do want to point out that it is really important to mention, like, not only do you want to talk about the two characteristics, gender and relative finger length, but you have to be really specific about the population you're speaking to. In this case, U.S. high school students who actually filled out the survey. So for the plant step, let's start by naming the test. And we do need to be specific here. Not only is it a chi-square test, it's a chi-square test for independence. So to get full credit, we have to say the whole piece there. Chi-square test for independence. Then our conditions, as far as randomness goes, we can say our sample was randomly selected, so that's good. We had one sample, one overall group, and it was randomly selected. For independence, 452 is definitely less than 10% of all U.S. students who filled out the survey, so we're good on the 10% condition. And then our last condition for the expected counts, let's go ahead and add those into the table. We should have room, and we'll make those be the circled values. 
So for the first cell here, remember it's row total times column total divided by table total, which should give us 77.96, and then 42.44, 106.59, 103.59, and up top over here, we've got 80.03, 43.56, and 109.41. Those are our expected counts. So we've communicated to the grader uh, where they're at. They're the circled values in the table. And note, they're all at least five, so that condition is met. All right, so for the do step, we need the test statistic with the degrees of freedom and the p-value. And we're going to get that through using our calculator. We did this in the last notes. We're going to use the chi-square test command, which, if you remember, you have to enter the observed counts into a matrix, matrix A, and the expected counts into matrix B. And if you do that, it gives you your test statistic chi-square equal to 2.065, which uses two degrees of freedom, and a p-value of 0.356. So to get full credit for the do step, we've got all three of those. We've got our test statistic. It's a chi-square distribution. It uses two degrees of freedom, and the p-value is 0.356, which is actually pretty high. Okay, lastly, for the conclude step, let's take that p-value and make a decision with it. And the p-value is pretty large, so we can say because our p-value of 0.356 is greater than our alpha level, which is 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, which in context means we couldn't find convincing evidence of that alternative hypothesis, which says, there's an association between gender and relative finger length. So our p-value was high, it was bigger than alpha, so we failed to reject the null hypothesis. We couldn't find convincing evidence that there was somehow an association between gender and relative finger length in this population of U.S. high school students who filled out the survey. Okay, in the last part for these notes, part C, it says, if your conclusion in part B was an error, which type of error did you commit? Explain. So our conclusion, we failed to reject the null hypothesis. So that means we could have possibly made a type 2 error. Remember, it's fail to reject for a type 2 error. So for part C, we can say, since we failed to reject the null, it's possible that we might have made a type 2 error. Which, if we have to say what that means in context, which would mean we conclude that there was no association between gender and relative finger length when there actually was an association. Okay, so that's our first experience with the chi-square test for independence. In our results, we said uh, we couldn't reject the null, we couldn't find an association, so we couldn't say that they weren't independent. Back to the beginning here, the most important distinction is between a chi-square test for independence and a chi-square test for homogeneity. That's all for these notes. I'll see you in class.